years. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. <laughs> Woohoo! Hey! Now I'm walking in, but I'm like, oh, look, he's dying short this time. <laughs> 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 Look, it's all right. Oh, I love it. Thank you. 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 Thank um, I want to say a few words before we get started. Uh, we've had a pretty busy month since our last meeting in March. Uh, we, we actually did a toiletries drive for Tulba County. Uh, some of you may know and some of you may have donated. We took a trunk load of you know, shampoo and soap and toothpaste and toothbrushes up to um, Tulbaden and delivered it and they were very grateful and I'm extremely grateful and proud of us for doing such a great job. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> I'd also like to thank Amicus um, Jacori who uh, owns Cafe LaRue. Mm -hmm. um, he allowed us to put a box out there and collect um, the donations. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I thought there was a microphone but there is not but I'm um, kind of loud. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> now, um, another thing that has happened this month is that we revised our subcommittee lists and descriptions. And then we just sent them out about a week and a half ago and asked for people to sign up for what they would like to work for. We had a good response. Um, let me just briefly tell you the, the titles of the subcommittees. We have bylaws revision. Financial strategic planning, fundraising, events and education, and I want to thank them tonight for putting this together and inviting uh, Teresa to come and speak to us. Then we have membership and outreach, communications, and affirmative action. Those three really need some more support. Yeah. So I'm going to be sending out one more email probably tomorrow just rounding up any last people who might want to rethink that. Membership and outreach is a huge scope, and there's a lot of different ways to contribute. So if anyone feels like they want to put a float together for the, for the parades that happen in the fall, or they would like to host um, a breakfast with Dems once a month, something kind of fun, outreach, please think about it and, and sign up. We, we can put you to good use, how you'd like to be of use. Mm -hmm. Communications also has to do with our getting the word out, whether it be on social media or press releases, that kind of thing. And then affirmative action is uh, a, the only subcommittee that is dictated by the Democratic Party of Georgia that we have. And we just need a couple more people on that subcommittee. So the final one is something that we're really going to be paying a lot of attention to this year, and that is campaign and candidate support. We want to recruit, train, and support strong Democratic candidates to run for office in this county and in this region. So um, we do have quite a few people on that, but the more the merrier. So what, if you see this email that I send out, if you're getting our emails, great. If you're not, please do this, use a sign-in sheet, and we'll add you to our mailing list, and you can, you know, join. I promise you that we won't waste your time, and you'll feel good about sticking it to the man. <laughs> um, did you ever see that movie, Rock, from, Rock, uh, what is it? School of Rock. Stick, right. it to the, stick to the man. Stick to um, the man. So anyway, all right. Another new thing that we had going on this month, and that is thanks a lot to Harry and our treasurer, um, Marjorie Jackson, is that we have an Act Blue link on our website and we can take donations electronically. Yes. So whether it be for membership or just straight up, you know, wanting to donate, um, it's an, we have an easier way to do it. We had our first donation yesterday and it was <laughs> lovely. Yeah. So, thank you. Okay, our next meeting will be here at the library, right across the hall in Synovus Room B uh, on May 14th, which is a Tuesday. And so I invite you to all look for emails about that um, and try to come and join us. That is where we're going to hear our first report outs from the subcommittees that we'll be meeting this month. 
and also from our post committees, whose job it is to reach out to their Democratic neighbors and get them to join with us in our efforts. So um, that should be a really interesting meeting. Now let me pivot mm -hmm. <laughs> to um, Mrs. Teresa Tomlinson. I, she's gonna to speak to us tonight about how Democrats are gonna take Georgia in 2020, so. Yes. Some of you know her story, but I'm just gonna give you a couple of highlights. Uh, she was first elected to mayor in 2010, and again in 2014. She was, she got over 60% of the vote each time. She was the first female mayor the first mayor to win re-election uh, in a contested race mm. since we incorporated or consolidated in 71. Mm -hmm. um, under her leadership, we've, we've done some really great things. Mm -hmm. um, property crime and violent crime have reduced by double digits. Yes. The budget was balanced for the first time in 16 years. Wow. And the city's pension, the county prison, and stray animal adoption <laughs> systems underwent some really incredible reforms. Um, I was especially, I remember when the whole, um, you know, with the, with the uh, animal care and technology, mm -hmm. that was a challenge, yeah. that was a challenge, <laughs> as were the other things. Now the quality and life improvements that were addressed during those years were um, all the biking trails and the walking trails and the whitewater course, I mean, just adding so much to the, vibrancy and mobility of this area. Um, also, the revitalization of the Liberty District, which is still going on, and downtown, which is uptown. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, there you go. So um, it, it's really uh, come to life under these under new years. Um, what I remember most about, and what I always remark most about, um, Teresa Tomlinson, is that you were always accessible. I was a military spouse um, for, for many of those years. And so we would see you at all of those events. You would talk to Democrats and Republicans, anyone. Um, you would ask questions, answer questions. Um, you're on Facebook, you had you know, your, your town halls. You, if, if someone wanted to speak to you, they couldn't say that you didn't give them an opportunity. Um, and I also appreciated that, although you were the first female mayor that didn't define what you were. You conducted business in a very direct, straightforward, competent, intelligent way. You didn't apologize like, oh, like so many of us learn to do, you know, as females. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say this, but no, no. <laughs> um, and you didn't hide your human qualities that some people may have tried to twist into uh, a sign of weakness. No, it was just part of part of who you were, part of who we all are. So that's kind of one of the things I remember most about you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. So let me please get out of the way while we hear from Teresa Pike Thompson. Yeah. Mayor Pete, to, you mm -hmm. know, yep. that's an 
interesting phenomenon um, because mayors know how to make government work. They mm -hmm. have to, or they will be run out of office. Right. Um, right. And so, and so, um, and so, as I speak about some of the things tonight, I want to tell you what's going on in Georgia, and then I'm going to give you. I've got my little piece of paper here because it's. I've got some numbers. I'm not going to bore you to death, but sometimes when I talk in generalities about the movement of um, sort of more progressive pragmatism going on in Georgia, people find it hard to believe. Mm. And and there are just a few little simple graphic images that I want to show you at the end, so so you can see it for yourself. Um, you can see where we're losing ground, where we're really making up ground. And so and so let's talk about that in a minute. But but to talk about what's going on in Georgia right now, um, first of all, Georgia has never been as red as we allowed it to be portrayed. Uh, we, we never um, were as red as the media portrayed us. And so we've sort of gotten into this perspective mm -hmm. that we're a one-party state. And, and the truth is, there's a, really a very small window when that might have been the truth. Because it took a while after uh, Governor Purdue was elected in uh, 2002, of course, for um, people to change parties and, and the House and Senate to flip with Georgia State Legislature. Um, it took a while uh, for folks, even in, in what we consider to be the rural red Georgia areas, which I'm definitely going to talk about in a minute, to flip from being Yellow Dog Democrats and Clinton Democrats and Roy Barnes Democrats to, to being mm. a deal Republican, mm. right? And, um, and in fact, some of the criticism that the, our two Republican governors, both Purdue and Deal, have had were that they were Democrats mm. once, right? <laughs> so, so when I say Georgia's never been as red as people suggest, that is a true statement. And the truth is, for somewhere between, depending on how you look at the numbers, I mean, for several years, at least five years, some may say a, a year or two more, we, when you look at how people pull ballots, how many people pull ballots, uh, whether they're pulling Democrat ballots, Republican ballots, um, what the data we have about them suggest, what their party affiliation is, because you all know in Georgia we don't register as a Republican or a Democrat, but there's been a lot of data for years that there were actually more Democrats in Georgia than there were Republicans. Mm. The problem is Democrats don't vote with regularity mm. that, that Republicans do. And so we were being sort of squeaked by mm. at the end, mm. right at the finish line, we squeak it on by. Mm. And even in those, quote, reddest of, of days, um, with all the, the millions of votes that were cast for a statewide election, it was pretty consistent that there were a 200,000 vote delta difference mm -hmm. between the statewide Republican and the statewide Democrat. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and what was interesting about that, we saw, uh, you know, people kept talking about the demographic changes. Atlanta's growing. The urban areas in Georgia are growing. Therefore, we're going to be turning more Democratic. But the truth was something else was happening. It wasn't just that people were coming in. It wasn't just demographically, is that people were responding to a particular message. And one of the most um, jarring moments when I realized that there was beginning to be a shift of the bell curve, the political bell curve, has really been to the right of center nationally, but certainly in Georgia since the Reagan years, beginning of the Reagan years is when the bell curve began to shift right. And when I realized this bell curve is shifting back, the middle was after the 2016 election. I, I could feel these other you know, things going on, a um, little bit of shifts, people being more uh, open to particular lines of thinking, such as the government is a partner in our lives. That when you say public private partnership, that the first word of that is public. So mm -hmm. there has, the government has to be involved in something, right? That, that it's a partner in our lives, it's a partner in our prosperity. First time I remember thinking, Wow, there's something really going on. It was right here at the library. Um, <laughs> we had been called, elected officials had been called, that there was a group, a group I'd never heard of. And they were all getting together and they wanted elected officials to come to talk to them about political engagement. Well, now, let me just be clear. I've been involved in politics since I was eight years old. 
My best friend's dad was a member of the Georgia State Legislature, and so instead of watching Disney movies and going to sleepovers, we were at meetings like this. Mm -hmm. We were in the back, but we were listening. <laughs> and we could see the celebration of community engagement. And, and her father thought it was really important. So I, I've been watching this for a very, very long time. And, and one thing you know for sure is after there has been a statewide election, whether it's a presidential election, whether it's a gubernatorial election, there's a dip in enthusiasm. And I don't care if you're Republican, Democrat, it, it doesn't matter. After the big hurrah, people go missing. Mm. So you can have yourself a Democratic Party meeting, you can have yourself a whatever kind of meeting you want, and about four to ten faithful souls are going to show up. So we get this call of all elected officials to come down the library. There's a group that wants to meet with us about, about civic engagement. And I thought to myself, well, that ought to be about a group of 10. So we ought to be out of there about 15 minutes. I'll swing by and we'll be <laughs> home for dinner. I met Carolyn Hughley out in, the, out in the parking lot. And so she and I hadn't seen each other for a while. We were just, just getting it. We were just talking, catching up, not even really looking where we were watching or where we were watching. And we walked into the room, and I think it's the notice room. And we walked in, and that place was packed. There, it was beyond. There must have been 125 people in that room, or more. And I looked up, and Carolyn looked up, and Carolyn said, "Who are all these people?" <laughs> and I said, "I don't recognize anyone." Mm. There were maybe three people in the room that I knew who they were, and the rest of them, I was like, "I didn't." I've been in politics in Columbus since, oh, I don't know, mid 90s. Right. And I've never seen you before. Mm. Right? <laughs> I thought, there's something weird going on. Well, let me tell you what's going on now. Fast forward. That level of engagement today, of course, we had the 2018 election, which is an off year election. And, and you all, uh, being engaged Democrats, are, are very well. And I say engaged Democrats, let me just recognize that I'm not going to point out and embarrass folks, but we've actually got some independent. And some li libertarians, and maybe even some positive Republicans in this group here tonight. And I want to tell you how much mm. I appreciate mm. you coming out. Yeah. Just, to, <laughs> just to listen. Just to listen. Right. Because I think people are intrigued. As much as we want to stay tied to these labels mm -hmm. and make it us versus them all the time, I got to tell you, there's a common denominator of good government. Mm -hmm. And honest to God, that's all people do. Mm -hmm. They want to go to bed at night thinking. They want to go to bed at night thinking. Well, I don't know what's going on with all this Hurricane Michael relief, but I know my elected official is going to get her done. They're going to figure this thing out. They're not going to pit one group of United States citizens against another group of United States citizens and say only some of them can get some aid. The rest of them ain't going to get no aid because. That's not a good state for us politically. Right. This state's good for us politically. We're they're gonna make sure you get A, the other ones. We didn't do that in New Orleans. Right. Right? And we have to say, well, you know, Louisiana, I don't know how they vote. We'll just <laughs> kind of spoon it out to them and see how they're US citizens and we respond. We're not going to let people <laughs> story. They got to make it. Easy. And I'm not, and we actually have some folks from the media. I want to thank them for being here tonight. Let's give the fourth estate a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> I say that because, look, they want to catch your attention. They got three minutes to put a story on the air. They got two seconds to grab your attention in, in the newspaper or online. They got to make it simple, you know? And, but the fact of the matter is, it's not just a liberal, conservative, Democrat, whatever. People are looking for pragmatism. They, they just want you to get it. So what, what's going on around around the state? There's there's beginning to be this common language where people are looking for quote unquote good government. And uh, and and I'm going now we had this this huge election in 2018. We had presidential turnout as I said and, and Delta wasn't two hundred. Mm. It's 53,000 with a question. It's 53,000. <laughs> and that's the official tally. 
the official calendar. And so something's going on. And people are expecting big, big things in 2020 because if that's a prelude to what we're going to have as far as enthusiasm and turnout, people find that as an indicator of the stress we want to encourage them. Hmm. So when I go to the Floyd County Democratic meeting in an off-year election, but when I go to the Coweta County Federation of Democratic Women inaugural meeting, I think I got 10 folks there in an off-year standing room in Fayette County, KK and politics, 100 something people. If fire marshal come in, the place would have been shut down. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you. And the reason why is because people are engaged, they are insistent <coughs> that we do better by our citizens and by our government, and they're not having it anymore. It is so obvious that the Washington power structure is failing us. And people have clued in to the fact that the reason why is because we were sent here. And we cannot expect to change the Washington power structure to keep sending the same people back who have demonstrated to us that they don't understand government and they don't know how to run. That is, you know, that is the biggest thing. And so, you know, I say all the time um, to our, our uh, friends, Republican friends out there, that, um, you know, they say that they want to drown the government in the back. Right, you heard that? That's the Frank thing. Was, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's uh, Grover Norquist. Norquist. Right. Grover Norquist. The drowned government in that. <laughs> and they want to strangle it and they want to Stop drain it and they want to whatever else. Because it's all kind of violent, mm -hmm. frankly. But they all want to do something to our government. And, and I always point out that the United States government is us. Right. I, mean, that, I know we have to go all the way back to fifth grade to remember that. But the United States government. Is us. It's not some villain. It's not some horrible thing on a hill far away. If you got a problem with it, because you're sending the wrong people. Right? And so and so you see that people are insistent about something changing. And you see that there is a failure of change. Um, and it seems to be that people are going to the main. That the Washington playbook be changed, and it be changed with pragmatic, progressive action. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to talk one second about um, progressivism before I get into the <coughs> other thing. But we've got to stop this people hijacking the English language and turning words around to use them as political. <laughs> progressivism leads to progress. You see, right. mm -hmm. so you go to bed at night praying you're going to get up in the morning. And that's progress. So, so the human condition <laughs> is to want to progress. Mm -hmm. Now, the great uh, conservative William F. Buckley. Buckley, thank you. Um, William F. Buckley. <laughs> um, free. William F. Buckley. Mm -hmm. What said that conservatism is standing on the train of history and yelling stop. Mm. I remember being in college going, what is that? Hmm. <laughs> Standing athwart the train of history and yelling, stop. Mm. Things are against progress. Right. Right. Standing athwart the train of history and yelling, stop. So, Democrats mm -hmm. like progress. Right. Human beings mm -hmm. like progress. Don't let people steal that word right. from us. Right. Tell them to Google it. And while they're, <laughs> while you're having <laughs> To Google the word socialism. Right. Because if they tell you progressivism is socialism, stop dead right in your track and say, what is socialism? Because I have yet to find one person hmm. that can define what socialism is. So let me just give you a quick thing. Socialism is when the government owns the entire industry. Right. Have you ever heard anybody say that when they wanted the ACA passed, or they wanted all citizens to have access to affordable health care, that their objective was to make doctors and nurses federal employees. Right. <laughs> to, to own all the hospitals and care centers out there, it is ridiculous. Yeah. We, we, have, we have to take back the English language. Mm -hmm. And we have to take back reason. So don't
don't let people own these words. Being a pragmatic progressive mm -hmm. means that we are forward thinking, we're going to have forward thinking solutions to problems, and, we, and we're going to do them like mayors have to do them. Or you have to do them in a way that is going to be implemented. So you can be aspirational. You can set a goal to, to have Medicare for all. Perhaps the first thing we should do is immediately pass Medicare for those 55 mm -hmm. years and older. Yes. And the reason why, a couple of them, because those folks are the ones who cost the most in the system. They're the hardest ones for the private market to handle to make a profit margin. And so if we take those out of the system and allow them through the expansion of, of Medicare, right, then, then the private market actually has an opportunity to retool and, and actually make money in a more efficient way than they're currently doing through pushing people off the rolls because of oh, high risk things such as being a woman. Mm, <laughs> right. Wow. right? <laughs> so, so, you know, those, that's what I mean by pragmatic progressivism. We can accomplish very progressive goals by being pragmatic about how we implement. Mm. The other thing that's great about expanding immediately Medicare at 55 mm. is that who needs it? But, but public safety officials, public safety police officers, firefighters across the nation retire at 55. And when they retire at 55, those 10 years kill them financially and literally. They are at an age that when they have to buy insurance, it costs them an arm and a leg. So here we go, we've got some cross-pollinization of the constituencies that might actually want an expansion of Medicare. And something we can do pragmatically by simply broadening the system as an initial step, letting the market correct, and then look at what the next step would be. Have you eaten the elephant from my head? <laughs> have, um, so, so let me get on with a, with a couple of other things, and that's just, just one example. And I want you all to have hope when they say, we live in this world of, you know, folks who, you know, greedy, everything's so partisan. Look at what's going on with a, quote, bipartisan effort now to decriminalize marijuana use, to, 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 to take marijuana off the Schedule One narcotic, right? Mm -hmm. We can still regulate it. Mm -hmm. We can still, you know, forbid and criminalize the, the sell of it or, you know, from cartels and other such things. Absolutely. But why can't American farmers plant crops of a desperately needed medicine for those suffering from cancer, from those suffering from chronic pain to have relief in a way more helpful than opioids, from those whose children are suffering from severe seizures? Why not? That's pragmatic You guys are hearing what well, those of us who are out in the state are hearing. People are sick of it. They are sick of it. They know full well that you do not have to separate families in order to have a strong immigration system. We <laughs> are sick of the political ego that's going on related to our health care system. When families just want an economic financial infrastructure in which they can prosper and have a fighting chance mm. to succeed, you know? That's all people are looking for. You know, the government is here to be a tool for your prosperity. And and if and, and if it is becoming a weight around your neck, then the reason why is because we are suing you. Mm -hmm. We are suing you. So think long and hard about it. That's what people across Georgia are very interested in. That's why they're turning out in droves to meetings like this. It's it's incredible. So how are we going to win? And I'll open it up for some questions. Um, let's see here. I've got this. I just wanted to show you all this. The first floor of college, sir, you didn't have any. I said, <laughs> and then I thought, you know what? I wanted you all to see something going on.
counties in central Georgia have traditionally been solid blue. Like you had a third of, of, of the county outside of Atlanta, right? So when we watch returns on election night and have counties coming in, 800,000 votes, 900,000 votes, and we're like, woohoo, <laughs> we're going to win. We're going to win. And then all of a sudden, tick, 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 mm -hmm. you know, the Republicans start eating away at it. And then you wake up in the morning and you lost. Mm. And how did that happen? And I say all the time, if they call it the rule strategy, they also call it the Coverdale strategy because Paul Coverdale, the former senator from Georgia, was the one who discovered this. He could see, he could see that they could not win with the magnitude of Democrats, particularly located in the urban areas of Atlanta, Muscogee County, Savannah, Augusta, and Athens, we, you know, and Macon. If, if those turned out, they mm. didn't have a chance. Mm. And so he thought, well, what about all these other counties? What about all these other counties? And so what they do, I say all the time, and it's like a, it's like going to dinner with 14 people, you know, and, and like the most expensive thing on the menu is $14.99. And sometimes you get the bill and it's 350 bucks, and you're like, how did that happen? It can't be right. There's a mistake. And you take out your calculator and you, you know, they add it in. <laughs> and, and the reason why is because all those 99 cents mm -hmm. and fees for refills mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Right. So it's incremental. So what they do is they have these really small margins in these counties that aren't particularly popular. I mean, some of these counties have, you know, 7,000 voters, mm. 30,000 voters. Nothing like DeKalb County, Layton County, Fulton, not nowhere near. But they're aggregating these margins, and we don't even play ball there. Mm. We just leave it. You know, we, we play ball in the urban areas because that's where we can, we can juice the numbers. We love to see those hundred thousands coming in. You know, we love to see it. The problem is they're winning by the inch. Mm -hmm. down here. We're winning by the inch. And so the reason why I show you 2014 is because this is what's killing us and this is what we have got to change. Um, if we had held on or expanded the black belt, this is how Doug Jones won, by the way. Mm -hmm. Doug Jones played on everywhere. Mm -hmm. He played every court. They let him on. He went everywhere. And, and uh, But what he did was he expanded the black belt in Alabama. Yes, he was in Birmingham. Yes, he was in Huntsville. And he was doing all the things you think Democrats would do, but they were spending a whole lot of time in their black belt. And instead of this, I'm going to walk in front here, they were doing things like this turned blue, this turned blue, this turned blue, right? They were expanding it. These were getting deeper and they were expanding it. So what's going on in Georgia? We, we're certainly adding to the growth in the urban areas. And we're through awesome efforts like Stacey Abrams' New Georgia Project. We're finding people, we're registering people, we're mobilizing them, we're getting them to polls. We're doing good, good stuff. But, but what is the number of people Since 2014, it's been about 2016. It's dwindling. Going red. Pink. Hmm. What's blue? So what happened in, in 2018, woohoo, we, 53 almost made it. Mm -hmm. We almost made it. And that's eyelash. And, and we would have won. So what happened in 2018? Ooh. We lost seven counties that were blue in the black belt. Every two years, it dwindles and it dwindles and it dwindles because we're not talking to people that live outside Metro Atlanta. Now, I love, I'm from Metro Atlanta, so I love talking to people that live in Metro Atlanta. It's awesome. And we need them. Let me make this clear. If we stop talking to people who live in Metro Atlanta, if we stop talking to the urban uh, core, well, we can hang it up because we're going to lose. Right. So how, how do we take these progressive principles that apply to all human beings because the human condition is to progress, not to stand athwart the train of history and yell stop. Right. How, how do we apply our good government progressive principles to all people? Well, I tell you how first thing we do is we start talking to people. Mm. Because 
if you think that these folks that live down there don't appreciate government, you're wrong. Mm. In fact, the government's role in their life is more critical than it is in Muskogee County or in Fulton County or any of these others because you don't have the options of public private partnership. In Muskogee County, if our local government doesn't have enough money to put in the sidewalks you want or the, the trail you want or the park that you want, well, maybe we can go to Aflac or Synovus or Tesis, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe we can go to the Bradley Foundation and get a drive going and have people match funds and, and, and we can get private investment like we did with the river. <coughs> City throws in a little sum sum, but it's private folks mm -hmm. that are really throwing it in, right? And and you you go. You you go to Jeff Davis County. Mm. See how many public private partnerships you can get going on. Mm -hmm. The largest employer in most of these counties is the school district. Mm. Wow. And, and yet they depend on the government for farm loans. Mm. They depend on government for the jobs. They understand they don't hate government. They just want it to work for them. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just looking for what? Good. Mm -hmm. And we've seeded that. So we have to take these better governing principles and philosophies we have, and we need to start talking to all of them. Mm -hmm. We need to stop believing that just because they live in the rural South, that somehow <coughs> they're quote unquote so conservative that we can't stand talking to them. Mm. Have you been to these areas and seen the diversity? Let me tell you something that you probably haven't. When I say don't know, don't know because you haven't thought about it, mm -hmm. right? If you bothered to look up like I did, you would have seen it. But there are 50 counties in here in the Black Belt. Mm -hmm. All 50 of those counties have between 40 and 60% minority population. Think about that. Mm -hmm. All 50 counties have between 40 and 60% minority population. Mm -hmm. How many of those do Democrats? How many of the 50? How many of them? 13? 21. Wow. We split it with these other ones. Minority majority or almost minority majority counties are mm. being split by Republicans and Democrats. Mm. I mean, they're not talking to them. And the truth is, they're demoralized because they don't know that they're living in a county that, that may well be a Democratic county or at least have the potential. Be a democratic county if people are talking to their influence mm -hmm. and people are explaining so i just wanted to show you all that and 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 tell you about the reality of what's going on and i've got other numbers but i'm not gonna i'm not gonna bore y'all with, with that but what's interesting about the dynamic is the engaged enthusiasm what's interesting is that talking about democratic principles is, is um, peaking the ears of people who've never listened before. Mm -hmm. And what's also going on is that we haven't talked to folks that want to be with us who are losing. Mm -hmm. So we can we can keep pushing and doing all the great things we're doing in these urban areas, but if, if we can't tell our good government story, the partnership story to these other folks, then we'll be losing ground on the other side of the equation. Mm -hmm. We talk about real strategies. Mm -hmm. wow. So that's why you see, and I, I and of course in 2018, um, Stacy and, and those folks did begin. They began the process of going to these places mm -hmm. that nobody had ever tie tie and you know place of carrot and 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 seeing folks there. Mm -hmm. But you know it was the first time. Right. First time a lot of them had been visited by mm -hmm. Democrats. Mm -hmm. Hard hard to turn a train around. Mm -hmm. Right? So um, that's what's going on. We should actually be very hopeful, but we've got to know that it's going to take hard work to make sure that we reach out to our neighbors. And you guys in Muskogee County are actually one of the most critical places. You're the largest urban center in this entire area where we lost most recently mm. the seven counties. Wow. We're going to have to reach out to our to our neighbors. Mm -hmm. we're, 
we're going to have to mobilize and we're going to have to spread this word. And so, um, and so if we intend to change the Washington, D.C. power structure and make it work for us, mm. right? Yeah. We, we're going to send people to Washington, D.C. who are actually going to bring good government to Georgia mm. and to, the, to our capital, to, to the Gold Dome, who are going to help make better choices for us. Um, we got to hold the line. Mm -hmm. We got to hold, hold the line outside of Atlanta as well as we can do it in the state of Georgia. Mm -hmm. So I want to open it up for questions. Um, as I said, Tom and I thought this might be instructive, um, but that's how we win in 2020. What we used to do well, what we forgot how to do, and, and we need to bring the same level of enthusiasm we've used in the urban areas to some of these areas that we traditionally want to. So yeah, what do you think? I think we don't talk, we just don't um, draw the connection between their lives and how government's going to run it. Um, you know, it, it's interesting that it's taken the Hurricane Michael and the, and the uh, tariff war on farmers to, for farmers to think that actually uh, government matters very much and that government is a partner in their lives. Um, and, and I think that, you know, Sanford Bishop figured that a while back, right? Mm -hmm. He talks to farmers, and he wins. Yeah. And you don't have to be, uh, you know, Sanford would probably be described as a, maybe a conservative Democrat, a blue dog Democrat. But you don't necessarily have to be mm -hmm. a conservative Democrat or blue dog Democrat to talk to farmers. Right. It's amazing when I'm out, you know, talking to farmers, people living in rural Georgia, that they're actually, they espouse a lot of, Philosophies that if, if you had to peg them, mm. sort of FDR Democrats or Clinton mm -hmm. Democrats, or mm -hmm. they believe in government. Mm. They believe in government. Yeah. I traveled through Christian County in the first very Sunday night to a little church back there. And what I've noticed is it's, it's a lot of Republican sentiment down there. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of weird. Yeah. But then. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. He was in Crisp County. That's and, right. Uh, Matter of fact, let me look up real quick. He said he was in Crisp County. I couldn't set this to take somebody asking something specific. Um, he said he was in Crisp County, and there was so much uh, Republican, um, you know, signage and things of that nature. And I, I think, unfortunately, they're not here on this list. I will tell you um, that some of those areas, the, the Democrats don't realize that they're living in a county that's in blood. Mm -hmm. They don't have a county party. Mm -hmm. You should go to the to the state Democratic Party at, uh, website and look at the state. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, look at the counties. Excuse me. Um, I'd say at least twenty five percent of them, maybe a little more, have have no mm -hmm. no structure at all. And and then there are some that have some, but it ain't much. I mean, we'll be meeting down there this um, yeah. this month on the twenty seventh. We really hope.
know, is to help. And that's how you create the private market, again, public-private partnership. So we got them all over the place. Yes, Dave. Well, Barry, I'll keep Barry. Yes, absolutely. Ooh. I, you know, have been so, um, so disappointed to see Chattahoochee County, our neighbor, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but they're they're one of the prime examples of, of what I was talking about earlier. Um, they're close, I think, fifty four percent. Yeah, fifty four uh, to 40, uh, 44%. percent. But again, when you start looking at their ratio, they're a forty percent minority community. So mm -hmm. we're not speaking to, to a lot of the folks there, and the folks who are there don't believe they're connected. To, um, to, to express yeah. they don't think they're Right. Um, I was reading this paper. It was a two-page paper in a PDF uh, online about how uh, when President Obama ran for office back in 2008 and 2012, right? He did um, when he when the results came out and they broke it down on a county by county basis. Um, he like this showed that that rural areas are not exactly a monolith. For example, um, and, he, and this, what, what it showed was that agricultural rural economies or agriculturally based rural economies um, did poorer uh, on like, it, 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 or like went more to the right uh, against Obama compared to rural, uh, rural economies that are recreation and tourism based. So I asked a, a cartographer from up in Atlanta uh, named Patrick Husbands about how um, Stacey Abrams did well, how she did last year in regards to uh, th those types of rural economies and which ones were more dominant. And she said, and he said that she did better, again, in rural economies with, with more recreation and tourism than the ones with agriculture. So, and the reason why that the paper showed was that the, the agricultural economies are the ones where people are leaving. The tourism and recreation areas are coming in migration. So is that a basis for a future democratic policy as to increase recreation and tourism in a lot of these rural economies and, and, uh, and counties. And is that a way to engage a lot of these individuals? Really great point. Right. Yes, is the answer. I think you see um, small efforts from like um, Main Street projects and things of that nature trying to go into communities like up here at Georgia, as I mentioned before. Um, you know, I, I just recently was in Thomasville, Georgia, oh, and the difference between what it was like 12 mm -hmm. years ago and what's going on there now simply because a, a lot of little things but one big example um the local dairy sweet grass dairy just decided to get a hip uh name and a website and some cool cheeses and a, <laughs> a, a hip little store and everybody's like flocking to thomasville to go get some sweet grass dairy oh, cheese wow. right right, right. And, uh, <laughs> and so you know you get a little you know awesome shtick mm -hmm. and you get a, a you know local owned businesses because you don't have to have you know too broad of a complex market as I was talking about or right. it's not like you're trying to bring a branch of 3M there which is just a whole nother right. circumstance you've got to have a certain workforce you've got to have the type of business structure they need but by God you can take a dairy that's already existing and, mm -hmm. and juice it up to be something that people find interesting and start creating your own authentic niche mm -hmm. and that's the type of thing that you were talking about ma'am that you're going to have to start thinking about in some of these you're going to have to find what's authentic about them and, and really start you know, mm -hmm. building from there. And one of the great ways to do that, you know, we have federal block grants mm -hmm. um, and, you know, finding more innovative ways to use that money for mm -hmm. those types of things. So okay. uh, let's see. Yes, sir. And then and then maybe just take a few more. Okay, five to ten minutes. Okay, five to ten minutes. Okay, yes. I, I knew we were running close. So, yes. So for the more, uh, for the more averagely engaged person, they may not be showing up to democratic meetings and just wants to do what they can to help swing those districts blue. What can they do? Because they can't really just drive by the county billboard and start this charismatic yeah. conversation. Yeah. <laughs> so, what is something they can do that's a little bit? That's so awesome. Yeah, thank you. And you're right. And of course, when I say things like we got to help, it, you know, I'm talking to the infrastructure and the soldiers here, right? You guys are the ones that are out there knocking on doors and you can help train other people and, and whatever your outreach is going to be. Through your effort, I know you're worried about how to do it here in Muskogee County, but you can certainly help them and energize them in Chattahoochee County, for instance. But so, what do you do? First of all, be a proud, pragmatic progressive. Be proud about it. Have a few 
human nature is um, who is going to be strong enough and brave enough for, to fight for me. And for too long, Democrats have been quiet about what they believe. Mm -hmm. We saw this with it used to, you know, sometimes people would call it, quote, being a moderate Democrat and all that. And I'm fine with moderation, I'm fine with balance and thoughtful consideration. But when it's really just being a watered down Republican, mm -hmm. because you're scared to say what it means right. to be a Democrat, people can't vote for that. Republicans can't vote for that. Independents can't vote for that. Democrats can't vote for it because they think if he's not brave enough to tell me what he thinks. Mm -hmm. Remember the woman in what was it, Tennessee or Kentucky, who wouldn't admit that she voted for Obama? Mm. Remember that? <laughs> Just simple question. Did she vote for Obama? Well, I don't want to say because it's my ballot secret. Right. What? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's yes or no. Right. You know, you're running for public office and and he's the head of the party. I mean, if it's no, just say, well, no, I didn't vote for him because I mm -hmm. differed with him on these various policies, and other people can wait. But it's secret, and I ain't going to tell you because why? Mm. I'm scared to admit I did. Right? Right, right. So it made her look disingenuous, but mostly it made her look like a Right. And so when there's things where Democrats won't answer questions about democratic policy, they mm -hmm. will say proudly what they mean and follow that logically to its conclusion. Our policies, I genuinely believe, are the better governing policies. They're more efficient. Mm -hmm. They result in less taxation. They invest, they invest in America and they create jobs. They broaden the middle class, which juices the economy in a sustainable way. Not through the gimmicks we're mm -hmm. seeing right now. Right. Not through the gimmicks. That's not sustainable. So, so the number one thing I would say you would is be proud. Mm -hmm. No matter where you are, no matter how engaged you are, be proud about the things you think and say them flat footed mm -hmm. and with courage. Okay, we've got just a few more. Yes. I'm just going to say a word in defense of socialism. Yeah. Bernie Sanders is my first choice for the presidency. He was my first choice four years ago. Uh, I voted for Hillary Clinton. I'm, I'm right. first of all, I voted for <coughs> Bernie Sanders. Did you know what the gentleman told me that? Of course, right. and that's and what I'm saying. Democratic Socialist. Right. And if you listen to Bernie Sanders, if you listen to Alexander Ocasio Cortez, the some of us, I mean, I'm 78 years old. She's real young for me. Mm -hmm. If you listen to them, they are talking about important ideas. Mm -hmm. And I use Norway as an example. I think you should vote like Democratic Socialists. Look up Norway on Google. Mm -hmm. See how they live. See what you object to about Norway. Sure. And if you can interview the candidate, please don't know. No, no, no. Right. And that's the point I was making. I refuse to let people say that government involvement in our lives. The government regulation and the things are important for <coughs> socialism. Mm -hmm. It is not. It's good, balanced government. Right. And so don't cede the English language to the other side. There's I've never heard AOC. Right. And we all like that. And we like that. Right? But, but that's just government involvement. I mean, true right. socialism is is you know owning the entire industry. No, yes. no that's communism. Yeah, yeah, that's communism. Regardless of their yeah. ability to pay, right? right? So it's not all government owned. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, but we do we, allow a competition. I hear you, and we're not we're not on opposite issues of this. Because we're not we all get fire department, department protection or police yes, protection. Right. Yes, we so all not all government owned. Right. Regardless, regardless we of can our provide. ability to pay, and, and and I don't think that using the term fully government owned is what socialism is, is right. what she's saying. It's yeah. kind of inaccurate. Right. Well, I mean, I'm just saying that that is the true, clear definition of it. Now, we have, we, I understand democratic socialism and, and, and absolutely with AOC and some of the new Green Deal and all of that are wonderful progressive policies, but we have to stop allowing labels to dictate what we're really talking about. Right. Because it's a lazy way to talk about what the, the policies that we really want. Mm -hmm. It's just that government is a partner in our life. And, mm -hmm. that the, and that the post office is an awesome thing. Right. I mean, one of the things that I've been talking about for a long time is why don't we have the post office providing IRS tax returns, the, the uh, refunds to people. Mm -hmm. Right? Because we could do away with predatory lending. Right. We could uh, provide them at low uh, interest rates. 
Um, we but could, are you afraid to call that socialism, even though it is? I, I, I would not call it, I would call that great government policy and program. And I, I think by, by just talking about things as labels, and, and if you think it's socialism and I think it's, it's great government policy, what's the difference? Right. Right? What's the difference? We're just getting hung up on the labels. And I'm afraid that's friendly fire. That's friendly fire. We'll hear about socialism and how it's treated. They will have a Sure, they, and they do, because they're more accepting. They have not lived through the 80s and right. the 90s and this conservative push that we've had for the mm -hmm. last 30 years, right? Right. They, they haven't. And so they're more accepting of government being involved in our lives, and they don't consider that a negative thing. Right. And so when you say socialism, they don't react negatively to it. They just don't. Yes. I wanted to uh, just ask about what's considered the basic Russian voting rights. Mm -hmm. Are these voters in rural counties registered? Uh, okay. There could be a lot more registration. Yes, they are. We're, we're, we're seeing sometimes voters, for example, they say they don't have as much infrastructure and it's tight in terms of the basic voting So, again, maybe building a few more models that can be incorporated to the smaller numbers. Indivisible is doing some really great work. Indivisible is doing some really great work. They, they are actually holding workshops in some of these areas and to help build. And this enthusiasm that I'm talking about, it is spilling over into the counties that did not realize that they were they were close to being able to make a difference in the state of Georgia just by voting for voters. And so yes. That's incredibly important, and there is some work going on uh, trying to build up that infrastructure. The Democratic Party has finally tuned into the fact that, that we just can't go and advertise and expect to awaken people in a march for the poll. We have to have an infrastructure. We all Yes. Well, thank you so much, Jane, for bringing us a little more in depth this time. And I know you've been thinking about the work that you all do so well. I grew up in Mm -hmm. That's how we can really re reconnect with those people. Yeah. They may be farmers, they may be kind of racist on the fringes, uh, or not even, not even in that, but they can be nuts. Because Roosevelt knew that that's what kept that place so decent, you know, mm -hmm. he could still do it. So I really think that the way you've approached this is the way to go. And uh, we can uh, <coughs> really make headway down there with those people. If we give up some of our stereotypes,
So we can stay and linger outside as long as we want, as long as we vacate here. But before you go, um, I want to let you know we shared, oh, if anyone has not signed in, if anyone does not, please seek out Patricia and we'll, we'll do that out, outside here so you can sign in. In, in the Visible um, is an organization that a lot of you may know about. And just something they're doing tomorrow, not, uh, actually no, today is Tuesday, Thursday night having a little uh, protest out on uh, Macon Road, right here in front of the library. And it is about releasing the full Mueller report. Um, so if you would like to, anytime between five and six, show up with a sign that's, you know, that says whatever you would like it to say in regard to that report. Um, but they, we, we, we've done this in men, many issues. Um, Yes, it is. Uh, they, are, they are targeting that specific date for that purpose. So you show up, that's it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's 743. It's 743. Okay. Oh Dominic, one more quick favor from Dominic. Before you leave, before you leave, uh, my name is Dominic Perkins. I'm the chairman of the Affirmative Action Committee for the DPG. And I just want to let everyone know that the draft plan for the 2020 National Delegate Selection. Um, which is the plan that we put together to um, select who are going to be delegates to the DNC is live on the DPG's website at georgiademocrat.org. So if you would take a minute to go look at it, um, this is a public comment period. So you can go on there, check it out, take a look at it, um, and give us feedback and the email address for that is public comment at georgiademocrat.org. So if you would take a look at it and send us feedback. Thanks, Thank you. You. Thanks everybody. Take care. <laughs> Thank you.